In 1961, Yuri Gagarin made a great leap to become the first man in space. I almost witnessed this myself as I was born seven months later, and my parents were so excited that they called me Yuri after him. Of course, as I was growing up came uh, a moonshot, and um, I just kept asking myself, is this as far as we can go? Is uh, solar system is really uh, our boundary? And can we actually go to the stars? So to try to answer some of those questions, I became a physicist. So then just a few years later came uh, a next great achievement. This is Voyager 1, which after 40 years of travel in space, uh, for the first time ever, left the solar system. So this is the nearby star called Alpha Centauri. It actually consists of two sun-like stars, and this is 25 trillion miles away. It takes uh, light four years to get there. So if they are watching our TV right now, they're seeing Barack Obama launching his re-election campaign, and uh, Donald Trump actually launching series 12 of uh, uh, of uh, Celebrity Apprentice. So what we really need to go to the stars is uh, we need something like a Moore's Law for speed. We need to go about 20% of speed of light to be able to get to Alpha Centauri in about 20 years. So it means 100 million miles an hour, which is a thousand times more faster than we can go right now. But the good news is that the Moore's Law seemed to be playing out in the previous 100 years, and we did achieve 1,000x uh, acceleration. But uh, the sober reality is that the chemical fuel is just not going to get us there. The problem with chemical fuel is that the more you need it to go fast, then uh, the, the more you still need it to accelerate what you have. So in order to accelerate one gram to the 20% of speed of light using chemical fuel, you would need to have it as much as the uh, entire galaxy. So it's not going to work. But uh, there is one solution that was actually invented a few hundred years ago by our ancestors which basically was very simple, try to leave the fuel behind and use just the sail and the wind. So in fact, the first attempts to test this technology have been already uh, achieved. And uh, um, you know, we have been trying to use the solar sail and the sun. But the problem is that the sun is just not too powerful enough to achieve the speeds we need. But we have been extremely fortunate in the last 15 years to have two unrelated transformative trends, which amazingly make it possible within the lifetime of our generation. So the one very familiar trend is uh, called microelectronics and the Moore's law playing out there. And another less known trend is uh, the Moore's law playing itself out in photonics. So uh, what we need to achieve uh, our objective is to get from uh, heavy spaceships like this to something like this. So we call this thing a starship, and it is on a scale of one gram and uh, the size of about one inch. It also has the capabilities of the Apple Watch chip, and uh, the cost of it is probably less than an iPhone. So the incredible thing is that we don't really need the Moore's Law to play out further. In the last 15 years, we had enough of it so that we can build a fully functional uh, spaceship with uh, pretty much everything we need, including cameras, the processor, the navigation equipment, 
the radio item battery and uh, the laser to communicate back to our planet. And uh, uh, again, as you can see, we can achieve all of that functionality, all of that functionality, including the ability to communicate back to Earth uh, in less than one gram. And we don't really need any further development to be able to achieve it. Now, this conversation we could not have had even 15 years ago because uh, the same functionality would uh, be about 100 times heavier and there would not be enough power to achieve the necessary speed. So if you put the star chip together with the light sail a few meters in diameter, you get something that we call nanocraft. So in order to push this nanocraft, I would do a little experiment. This is a standard laser that you can buy in, in a store. So if I can point this laser at the sail for about a day in space, uh, this nanocraft will accelerate to a speed of uh, an ant. So what you, what you need to do is to have a much bigger laser. And again, the, um, the incredible and less known fact is that this actually can be done in principle. So in the last 15 years, we developed a technology which is called phase locking, which allows us to build significant arrays of standard lasers synchronized in a, in a way that effectively makes one big laser. Of course, we need a lot of those lasers. We need the, on a scale of few million standard sized lasers to be able to get 100 gigawatts of energy we need to accelerate one gram to 20% of speed of light. But the Moore's law is, uh, is again on our side. If history is of any guidance for us, it have almost perfectly been playing out both in cost and uh, in the power of lasers. So this is pretty much how it can look like. So this is a laser array on the ground, maybe somewhere in Atacama Desert. So this is our nanocraft, which is released by the mothership about 30,000 miles from, from, the, from the Earth. You need to be very precise in doing this. The acceleration takes about a few minutes, and our spaceship is traveling at about 20% of speed of light. So it goes uh, for about 20 years. Because you launch probably a few thousand of them, a fair fraction of them will survive the interstellar dust collisions. As you are approaching the star, you are repositioning yourself to take a few images of a possible planets out there and then you send them back to our planet using this uh, communication laser on board. In addition, you are using the sail once again as a dish to focus the laser beam. And then it takes four years to get the signal, to get those pictures back, and you use the same laser array uh, to receive those images. So this project is obviously not without technical challenges, and there are, <laughs> and there are many of them. But, uh, but the uh, almost incredible thing is that it seems like the research we have done is showing that there are no fundamental deal breakers. Each one of them is difficult but doable in, on a scale of maybe 25, 30, 35 years. Now, I would want to bring your attention to one of them called policy issues. In order to build a machine like this on the ground, you will probably need something like a global consensus and an international organization which will control that type of machine. So we'll have a pretty incredible advisory committee consistent, consisting of one of the best scientists and engineers on the planet. Uh, a few of them are Nobel Prize winners. And uh, we also have 
a very interesting board of directors consisting of two people, Stephen Hawking and Mark Zuckerberg. So when, uh, when I was uh, in college, I uh, witnessed a space race. Uh, at that time, it was between United States and Soviet Union. But in order for us to achieve the next great leap, it will have to be a consensus-driven global international effort. And uh, I believe that this is one of these things that can actually unify all of us around one single objective, which is reaching to the stars. And our generation is really the first time ever that has this incredible opportunity with a technology just beyond the horizon uh, to achieve interstellar travel. Thank you very much.